That's it. So with that, let's cultivate wellness. Okay, I'm here with Anthony Lasquadro, founder and director of Intaction. You can find them at intaction.org. Anthony, how are you? Great. I'm doing great today. Thanks for having me on the show. Hey, I'm real excited to uh, talk to you about the about this. So intaction.org is a circumcision, male circumcision uh, sort of educational uh, institution. Is that right? Well, Brad, you know, I have an unusual job. My job as executive director of Intaction is to help educate Americans and make them aware, first of all, about the benefits of foreskin, why it's actually an important body part, and why we shouldn't be cutting it off baby boys. Yeah, and so that's, you know, I, I, I'm a father of two boys, um, five and two, and, you know, I'm, I'm thinking back to my experience of, you know, trying to advocate for the for not doing this to my wife and even my mother, of all people, who, you know, they're just sort of, they, of course, the, this is not a common thing for people to research, and they just sort of go with the flow, and, you know, circumcision comes in and out of uh, favor, seemingly depending on whether insurance covers it or not. Um, and, you know, I was, at the time, I'm thinking back to it, I was blown away at how... Uh, entrenched in their position they were and luckily i was able to con you know convince them hey at least let's you know it's not medically necessary let's wait and just well you know and they they eventually agreed but it was a, it was a real fight and that was just surprising and uh, you know so I'm, I'm happy that you're here to help dispel some of this stuff um so let's just give a brief let's start with a brief overview of sort of you know what circumcision really is and if we could even compare it I know this, hopefully this isn't too controversial, um, but, you know, there's circumcision for men, circumcision for women, and I know, I think I know, for women, female genital mutilation, obviously awful, uh, but there's different levels, and male genital mutilation can be, uh, in some instances, can be just as bad. Is that right? You know, that's correct. Uh <laughs> People think that female genital mutilation is one thing, and it's a spectrum of things that are done to little girls, depending on the culture or tribe that they come from. And it's not all done by, you know, something that they might see in like National Geographic, where uh, someone's a little girl's being held down in the bushes and, and a rusty razor blade is being uh, applied to her. Uh, so many places it's done by doctors in hospitals in Indonesia or, or the Middle East. The same as what we do to little boys here in America. Yeah. And so, you know, if I, I, I guess my point of bringing that up is to illustrate that, you know, if you're against female genital mutilation, and I think that most people are, um, at least most Westerners are, uh, I certainly am. Um, you know, understanding that it certainly is a spectrum and it can be, you know, much, much worse, but the male genital mutilation can be just as bad. And so if you're against one, you should be against both. And I don't, I, I have a, I have trouble wrapping my head around just the idea that, oh, it's a, it just because it's a, a boy, you know, it must be different or it's not a big deal or it doesn't hurt them. I mean, just imagine having, you know, a, a, a large portion of your skin cut off. And then saying that's not going to hurt, you know, it's it's baffling to me. Um, can you describe some of the uh, roadblocks that you hit in general? Like, what are people's most common misconceptions? Uh, some of the most common misconceptions, you know, here in America is is that uh, uh, the American people have been sold a bill of goods into believing that this is necessary for medical. Uh, reasons. If you don't take off the foreskin, a uh, boy's going to have a lifelong series of medical issues and problems. And, and it's just so ridiculous because, you know, Americans are so parochialized and that they don't even realize that most of the world, the men are intact. Like you look at Europe, you look at other Western or developed countries, the men are all intact. They're like less than 2% are circumcised. And those are done for religious reasons. Maybe they're Muslim or Jewish. But European men are mostly all intact, and they do just fine. They're very happy, and they could never even countenance the thought of having their foreskin removed. So 
that's one of the, you know, the, the first things is Americans are just so, uh, uh, they've got the, you know, they got such narrow vision. They think that everybody does it just because Americans have, for the most part, been doing it for the last hundred years. Yeah. And and they, could, they couldn't be farther from the truth. Yeah. So I've heard of those that, that claim that there is medical benefit to a male circumcision. And what I think the, correct me if I'm wrong, I think the main argument there is penile cancer. Is that right? That's one of them. I mean, they've they've tried to say that keeping your foreskin is going to put you at risk from everything from HIV to to penile cancer to prostate cancer to uh, uh, STDs, syphilis, gonorrhea, chlamydia. Even they were even trying to link the Zika virus that you are at risk for getting the Z transmitting the Zika virus if if you had foreskin. The, this is a, a medical income issue. Doctors want insurance reimbursements, and the, those that lobby in their behalf do that, and they, they offer up these claims of studies, and they hype studies to try to back up what they're really after, and that's the money. Yeah, so just to, I, I looked it up real quick. The, the incidence of penile cancer, it's a rare cancer um, with an annual incidence varying from 0.3 to 1 per 100,000. Um, you know, the incident, that's such a small incidence. And of course, if there's something I can do to prevent penile cancer in my sons, I would do it, I think. Um, but that's a, there's, it's going to be a large, there's a lot of factors going in there, right? It's not just, right. oh, I have foreskin. Penile cancer is such a rare cancer. Yeah. Uh, first of all, European men have no higher rates of penile cancer, and they're all intact, than American men that are cut. Penile cancer is really a disease of people that are, you know, uh, they don't wash themselves for weeks and weeks and weeks, and the skin becomes irritated and inflamed, and, and maybe they smoke on top of that. Maybe they have diabetes issues or uh, metabolic disease, and all of these things are factors for for cancer to to kind of get a foothold but having the foreskin really is is not an issue yeah so i just comparing it to a more common cancer of breast cancer uh that's much more common and i think it's uh if i remember correctly i think it's like maybe one in four women uh would get breast cancer sometime throughout their life but we're not doing preemptive mastectomies to to combat that, and rightfully so, I don't. I think that would be a terrible idea. Um, but for some reason, when it comes to little boys, that sort of sa that same compassion, that same sort of logic, doesn't really follow. And I'm, you know, it, it's it's just a it's a very strange thing. And describe. I think it might help people to maybe understand a little bit better the the, the dangers or the the real negative side effects. Could you describe what takes place during a cir circumcision on a newborn? I mean, doesn't it happen on day one usually? Uh, it, it depends on when the baby's going to be discharged, the baby and the mother, and uh, what the doctor or residence schedule is in, in terms of doing them, getting them done. They'll try to do maybe a couple of babies at the same time. So uh, if you have your child circumcised, they may be doing it at three in the morning if you're going to be discharged uh, at eight. That's a um, that's a that's a horrible way to wake up. That is a horrible way. But do you want somebody operating on your penis at three o'clock in the morning? And what condition are they in? <laughs> no, absolutely uh, not. <laughs> you know, uh, people think that you know the doctors do it. a lot of times. It's the residents or the physician's assistant that are doing it, and. To be honest, they, they don't have a lot of training in this. There are a lot of botches and complications. You know, the motto is, you know, see one, do one, teach one. That's that's kind of the, a lot of times the motto because this stuff's not taught in medical school. It's kind of on-the-job training. One pr practitioner will show the other one how it's done. And oftentimes it's not done with any anesthesia at all. And if anesthesia is used, it's ineffective. And, uh, you know, that's why we see a botches and complication rate as high as 11, 11 to 25 percent. Yeah. So, I mean, just imagine having for those listening, just imagine having, you know, any surgery where they're cutting a large portion of your skin without anesthesia and now put yourself in a baby's position where they have no idea what's going on. You know, at least you as an adult, you could mentally prepare for it and 
I don't know that that would help that much, but you're cognizant of what's happening. Where a little baby, you know, they just come out of the womb. They rely on, you know, these the adults around them. They probably assume that it's their parents. You know, they know their mom and dad. Uh, that they're supposed to be protecting them, and all of a sudden, chop, it's gone. And it's, I mean, the excruciating pain and the mental anguish that a baby must go through. Is it true that their cortisol level levels spike and they don't, like you can the you can measure the cortisol is elevated for even months and months after the procedure? Brad, you know, there, there's so many things a baby goes through. First, let me start off. It's not a, a, chop, a quick chop. This is a procedure that takes as long as 15 minutes. Jeez. Um, God, that, I mean, uh, that's yep, excruciating. Yep. I mean, that must feel like a year. It, 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 you know, for a baby, it seem, must seem like a lifetime. And, you know, we have reports of babies vomiting, choking. I had a, neuro, you know, being an, a, an activist in this, uh, I have a lot of people contact me, whether they're in medical technicians or, or uh, personnel that kind of give me behind the scenes of what's going on in their hospital. I had one neurodiagnostic technician tell me her, her job was to do brainwave studies on, on, on babies that may be having seizures and stuff like that. And oftentimes inexperienced doctors would send an infant after circumcision to her to do a brainwave study EEG and because they the doctor thought the baby was having a seizure and what that means is the baby's eyes are rolling back in his head uh it's having difficulty breathing and uh they would do a brainwave study and they didn't found any they didn't find any specific defect with the brain but what the baby was doing is is going almost into a shock-like response from from the circumcision from having the the foreskin basically ripped off from the head of the penis because you have to understand the foreskin is adhered to the head of the penis in an infant just like your fingernail is attached to your finger finger bed the fingernail bed they have to peel that off they have to do a dorsal cut with the scissors and, and then they have to apply a device uh, known as a circumcision clamp, which crushes the foreskin because if they didn't do that, the baby would, would bleed to death. So they have to crush the foreskin in order to establish hemostasis under the skin, which is clotting. And so if I could, you know, relate this, this would be like getting your fingers uh, caught in a slam shut in a car door, except we're going to keep the car door slam shut until the bleeding stops. God. That's what a baby has to endure. And for 15 minutes, and with little to no anesthesia, the doctors, doctors say, oh, we use or, or the, the PA or the resident will say, well, we use anesthesia. We use an Emla cream. An Emla cream is supposed to be like a numbing cream. And if I put some on your arm and, and then stuck you with a needle, you'd hit it. You'd hit the ceiling because it really is ineffective. Yeah. And uh, so that that's the anesthesia. A lot of doctors don't want to use anesthesia because they waste their time. They can't move as fast. And they haven't been trained in how to administer it, and they, and you know what? At the end of the day, end of the day, babies really can't complain to anybody. I mean, it's it, as you describe it. I mean, it's just sad. I mean, it, it makes me cringe just thinking about this stuff. And <clears throat> I don't. I mean, it's it's hard to even know where to begin with it. Just it seems like an obvious like, hey, this is a, a barbaric practice, and it's not necessary. You know, if if the circ if a circumcision is really all that medical medically beneficial, then wait until it's, there's an age where you can safely administer real anesthesia, and the child understands what's happening, and you you know I don't know knock them out and give them actual general anesthesia, knock them out so there there's not that sort of that pain response and that that horrible fear associated. You know, I mean it's just bizarre. Is there you know, is there an argument for doing it that, or let's, you know, let's say that it was as beneficial as they say it is. Is there an argument for doing it that early? The argument is, is a baby can't fight back. Okay. <laughs> so you try to tie down an 18 year old and tell him, we're going to take off part of your genitals, whether you like it or not. Okay. And, uh, you know, you want to talk about world war three. I think you would experience that. Yeah. So the, the major reason is, is that uh, babies can't fight back. Parents think they're doing the right thing. Actually, they're making a huge mistake. And and, and that, that's why it's done to babies. You know, in the, in the early 1900s, they tried to convince men to get circumcised adults. And, you know, uh, 
because there was this uh, uh, Victorian uh, uh, morality mentality of the age and sex was looked at as dirty and genitals were dirty and masturbation was was horrible and they thought by if they can convince men to remove their foreskin that they wouldn't masturbate so much or be aroused by erotic uh, literature of the day and so they tried to convince men to get circumcised and that marketing effort fell flat so then they recalibrated uh and this is in the literature in, in books of you know medical books and, and historical texts of the day then they decided to convince parents to circumcise their sons as infants because uh that would be an easier sell and once they can get most americans circumcised then it would be a self perpetuating practice because if fathers were circumcised then they would feel they want the same thing for their sons so yeah. obviously if a father didn't do that it would be almost an admission to himself that he was damaged in some way or, or deprived of his foreskin so he can't admit that to himself it would be harmful to his ego and and, and maybe threaten his masculinity so if it's good enough for dad it's good enough for my boy yeah and you know, obviously, we don't live in a time of Victorian um, uh, morals. I mean, it's sex and uh, genitals and all of the all of that goes all that goes with it are clearly looked at much differently. I mean, it, you know, people are we. That's a that may, maybe a topic for a different show. But you know, I was I was circumcised, and I know that my mom didn't. You know or my parents I should say they didn't make a decision to hurt me they weren't they were doing what the doctor told them to do they weren't they were told one thing I mean obviously if a doctor tells you you know a new mom or even a, a seasoned mom hey this is good for your kid and here are the reasons why and it doesn't hurt you know they're going to listen to that expert and you know follow through with the procedure and you know, I do look at myself as somewhat damaged. Um, I, you know, I, I don't know how it how my life would be different otherwise, but I'm sure there would be some differences. Um, but I don't hold it against my mother, and I don't think that people should hold it against their parents. I would think, you know, except for in my case where I have this information, and if I ignored it and did it to my sons anyway, I would expect them to hold it against me in the future because I, I have that, that, that knowledge. Um, so, you know, and in these situations, you know, we're talking about this as if it, it's hard to, it's almost conspiratorial. And I don't, I don't really like that word, but, you know, we're talking about people, you know, they, they want us to, they wanted men to do it uh, in the Victorian age. Men didn't want to, that sort of fell flat. So then they moved on to the parents and to get the parents to do it and then it just keeps going and that now you know it's a, it's self-perpetuating men don't want to admit that they're damaged so they just do it to their sons and i just i really don't understand what the motivation is today is it really just money well uh, again just stepping back a second you know when i don't know when you when you were born i was born in the 60s and there was no internet and my parents couldn't look this stuff up they had to rely on the, the advice of the doctors and uh, uh and so so that's what they did but 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 nowadays uh, this information is all over the internet it's all over social media and, and not only that there are groups organizations like my organization in Taction and there are others that are all around the country trying to make people aware of this. So I think people today have less of an excuse not to be woke on, on this topic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, but when, when our parents were around, there was no internet. And unless you went to maybe a, a medical library, if you even had access to something like that to look things up, you really, you really didn't know. I, I can tell you when my son was born a few years ago, the doctor came into the room and he's like, not knowing what my background was and he tried to convince us to, to circumcise my son uh, and uh you know I, I had to basically tell them three times we're not doing this and you know I, I i was becoming angry i didn't want to get my wife upset because after what she was through with the delivery and everything yeah. but I, I was becoming incensed that they kept pushing this on us and uh you know if if you have a parent out there that is not as knowledgeable as 
as perhaps we are, uh, they, they may fall they may fall victim to the doctor's pressures. Uh, I've had people come up, you know, because we do a lot of public events, and people have told me that the doctors kept harassing them to circumcise their son. This is in like a New York City hospital. And uh, so parents are still under pressure to do this. And uh, so it's, that's where we come in. We have to give people the information so they can kind of arm themselves against these uh, uh, pressure tactics. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, it's, and I think it's a, it's a noble, a, a noble endeavor for sure. Protecting children from this terrible, clearly, ob- clearly terrible procedure. Um, but just going back to, you know, the information on the internet and people <clears throat> don't have as much of a reason to be not woke. Um, you know, this is one of those topics and I'm sure you are very familiar with this, that if you posted something on Facebook about it, it would be an immediate riot. You know, people get from what I've seen, at least people get very incensed and very, very, uh, angry on both sides, really, and it, it's it's tragic that you can't just have a conversation about this online. So even if someone is looking it up, you know, they might get that social pressure again from their peers, if you can even call Facebook peers, but get that social pressure from their peers and then turn around and then the doctor is also saying the same thing. You know, it's I don't blame people sometimes for that sort of uh, that bombardment of, uh, of shame. And it's, it's tragic. It really is. I, I wish that it was a more open topic. So I, again, I probably a good place to say thank you again for, you know, coming on and helping, uh, dispel and encourage people to con- to conversate about this in a more reasonable fashion. Uh, but let's talk about the long-term side effects of a circumcision, uh, to kind of give people a little bit more like, you know, idea of the it's not just a horrible thing to happen to a baby but it's a horrible thing that affects men as well right so you know there's, there's all the pain and trauma and stress that that a baby is subjected to you know that this they're, they're strapped down in this contraption to just make them spread eagles so the doctor can do what he's going to do to them uh so once we get past all that and we get into older you know older person uh you know the foreskin, you can't alter form without altering function. Nature put the foreskin on our body for a reason. And it's what we call the four powers of foreskin, which is pleasure, protection, lubrication, and connection. So uh, the foreskin has an important function uh, on the body, and people think it's this useless flap of skin like it's an appendix or something and you can remove it without altering anything. So that's kind of like a misconception we try to overcome. But uh, moving on and, you know, when a guy is older, first of all, I can tell you from like my own experience, I always wondered why is there a scar on my penis? I wasn't in any accident or uh, nothing happened to me that I could recall, but yet there's this scar on my penis and nobody wants to talk about it, right? They don't come up to you at some point when you're 13 or 18 and say that scar on your penis is because we decided to cut off part of your genitals we thought you didn't need it uh so you get the sense of almost like there's uh uh maybe you were betrayed because if they don't want to talk about it then there must be something wrong about it um there's there's the feeling of you know this was done without my consent nobody asked me it wasn't necessary uh, you know, so these these are some of the uh, consequences that come up, plus loss of sexual function, and that can vary depending on on the individual. For for a normal circumcision, maybe it's not as much, but again, you can have up to a 25% botch rate in circumcisions. Uh, there's conditions known as meatal stenosis, which is a narrowing of the urethra from scar tissue, and can cause difficulty with urination. Uh, there could be lack, loss of sensitivity during sex, so people may feel, guys may feel like they, their relationships are damaged because they, they, they don't have uh, normally functioning genitals. And, and so, so these are some of the things that come on later in life. Yeah, the, explain more about the botch, because, I mean, a 25% rate in botching a circumcision is a pretty high rate, and, you know, that sounds like a... It, it, a sort of catch-all term, 
what can happen during a botch? So, you know, it, it varies everything from removing too much skin to excessive bleeding and infection to uh, things like I mentioned, meatal stenosis, where the urethra, which is what you urinate through, that can get crushed or scarred so the urine doesn't flow out properly. Uh, and, and then later on, they have to kind of go in and, and clean that up somehow uh, to loss of parts of the penis. I mean, there's several cases. I've been involved with a few of them on, as uh, legal uh, advocates where portions of the head of the penis, what we call the glance penis, was removed. Jesus. Or, uh, I mean, there was uh, Stacy Willis, uh, who was a mom down in Georgia. Uh, part of part of her son's penis was was removed because they used a type of circumcision clamp called the Mojin clamp, which is still widely in use. And I've spoken to a number of doctors, and they say, "Oh, we use this all the time. If you know what you're doing, it works great." Meanwhile, they don't even realize that the original company that made this, the Mojin company, was bankrupted from malpractice claims. These devices are still out there and they're still widely used. They provide no protection to the head of the penis. And again, if you get one of those 3 a.m. circumcisions, somebody's maybe a little bleary eyed. They don't realize that the head of the penis can become entrapped inside the clamp. And when they go to remove the foreskin, that comes off with it. So uh, in that particular instance, in Stacey Willis's case, uh, the doctors tried to cover it up. They put the, the cutoff part in the freezer and told the mother, wrap the baby up, told the mother, take him home. And the mother couldn't figure out why the baby wouldn't stop bleeding. And I uh, went to the emergency room and they unwrapped all the bandages and found out part of the penis is missing. Uh, she, was, she was awarded $33 million last year. So, because the case was just so egregious, uh, but there, there's uh, there's cases of babies dying. Uh, they wake up and you know uh, and go into shock and just never recover. Uh, they have bleeding, hemorrhaging that just won't stop. Sometimes it's an indication of a clotting disorder. Uh, it's it's really the gamut. So you know, uh, uh, from from death to to lesser complications. Uh, um, so, the, the, you know, these are so, and, and what's just so incredible about it is if you would, if people would have just left it alone in the first place, there would be zero problems. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And I mean, it, as you're talking, I'm sort of thinking about this sort of a, a, as a, from an evolutionary perspective, in that, you know, if you believe that the point of life is to procreate, and, you know, I, I sort of lean that way that, you know, everything that you do is, is in an effort to create more life. And the the organ that you have to do that, to uh, to, proge to, to create progeny and make your DNA last forever, you know, or, you know, at least to the next generation, it's no wonder that there's so many problems because that's your organ that does that. That's the organ that makes that possible. And, of course, if you're going to, it just seems like a no-brainer if you go and significantly alter in such a harmful way that organ it's going to cause a lot of negative side effects or even you know in, yeah, in some cases apparently even death um it's it's i've said this a few, a few times already but it's tragic it's it's disgusting really uh given there's, what there's, we know yeah there's just two cases i i've assisted the attorney on one of them right here in new york same doctor he botched two babies Two different hospitals with the same Mojin clamp, okay? And, and the baby is basically missing part of his penis. He's going to have to – you're starting off life, okay, already with a handicap when you shouldn't even have had one. This, this, this boy has to go through life, and when he dates or he gets married later in life, he's got to go, well, yeah, I was circumcised and I, I'm, <laughs> I lost part of my penis. And why should anybody have to – endure that for for no reason yeah it's it it really just sort of i mean it, it's it's a good argument for the disposability of of males um and you know it, it's uh it's 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 gross and i, I hope that it changes the you know ugh. i don't it's hard to even know where to go next because it's so grotesque um the, the other thing is the attitude of doctors you know doctors live in a world where you know some patients live, some patients die. That yeah. happens every every day. And they feel that, look, if, 
you do so many circumcisions, eventually we're only human. We're going to, some of them are not going to turn out the right way. And, and that's just a cost for them. That's just the cost of doing business. They, they'll turn it over the case to their insurance company and there'll be some kind of settlement or whatever case closed, life goes on. And this boy has to go through life in this condition for what? Yeah. For what? Yeah. I mean, I hope that, I mean, that is certainly true. It, it is the, there's a cost of doing business with every single surgery. You know, there's not a hundred percent success rate with everything. Um, you know, you do enough heart surgeries, one day you're going to fail. You do enough circumcisions, one day it's going to fail. Um, and, you know, I certainly, that that is definitely their attitude, I, I think. Um, but, you know, when a baby dies, I, I, I would, I would imagine that most doctors would be, there would be some sort of uh, mental anguish. Maybe they they would definitely feel bad. I guess about that, right? I mean, it's not that they just don't care. Look, I, I know a, a nurse that told me in her hospital the doctors were refusing to use anesthesia at all, and she could hear the baby screaming down the hallway. And uh, she went to the hospital administration and it got a pain policy written up in that, you know, requiring them to use something and it got posted and they still ignore it. So do they really care? I, I don't know. I'm not convinced. Yeah. I mean, I guess, you know, maybe they don't care to use the, the anesthesia, but you know, if, if, if they lost a baby, I, I, I would hope that they would care. Um, but let's talk a little about what I think, you know, the, the circumcision issue is one of the more fascinating things, uh, in my understanding, and you know, hopefully you can shed some more light on this, is the the studies that have or have not been done or got started and ended due to, um, uh, I guess, moral reasons. Uh, are there any studies that have been done on circumcision and, and its effects on babies, like in the in the moment, to prove its e efficacy? Uh, or is it just, like, or is it just like a right. cultural thing? Like, I mean, so I guess what I'm, my, what I've heard is that they will try that studies have tried, they've tried to do studies on babies as they're, they're getting them circumcised to, you know, test the effect of, I don't know, maybe I can't remember exactly, but maybe it was something like testing the effect effectiveness of the, that topical an, uh, anesthesia or topical pain cream or whatever it is. Um, and they actually had to stop the study because it wasn't working and there was a ethical, they had an ethical obligation to stop the study because of the, all of the patients were just getting so, were in so much pain. Um, and so, you know, what I mean is, well, first is that, do you, are you aware of that? Is that story true? But second, um, you know, is there, are there studies that, that, you know, I guess you can take a, a study of, you know, you have a baby that's circumcised and a baby that's not circumcised and measure their cortisol, um, you know, they down the road, like at six months and one year and stuff like that, and, and compare them and see the baby in, with the circumcision has higher cortisol levels. Um, but that, to me, I don't, I don't know the exact terminology, so I apologize, but... You know, it's just sort of like, oh, we have the patients already there. These parents are doing it willingly. But I, what I mean is a study of like, hey, we're going to go into a clinical setting. We have two sets of babies that are, they're all uncircumcised. We're going to circumcise one group and not circumcise the other group. And we're going to test them that way. Uh, like a true I, I clinical just, trial is what I mean. I, I'm not any, I'm not aware of any specific studies on that that I can cite. I know that, uh, I know there was, one doctor that had uh, did some, uh, I believe it was MRIs, I don't know if it was PET scan, but I think it was MRI of babies' brains before and after circumcision, and he noted structural changes in parts of the brain due to the pain response. So Structural never, changes? Yeah, you know, like the parts of the brain, like the yeah. hippocampus and the amygdala. He noticed some changes before and after, but that was never published um uh, there, there was another one on on pain specifically that they did stop because because of ethics, but I don't ha I don't have the exact uh, citations in front of me on that. But we you know we do know that you know the trauma, pain and trauma, does cause release of cortisol. Yeah. You know, 
cortisol is what they call the death hormone because it's the level rises in older people. It kills brain cells. It's associated with disease. It's a stress and hormone, yeah. It's a, it's a, you know, so uh, for, for an infant child to, to be have their brain subjected to high levels of cortisol, it, it can cause long-term damage to the developing brain. And uh, when it's for an unnecessary procedure, like circumcision, these these are some of the things people need to take into consideration. Absolutely, <clears throat> yeah. So, I think you know. I think we have sort. Of, I think we've we've talked a lot about male circumcision. Uh, hopefully, we've convinced at least a few to second guess and do some research, and or maybe even you know they're convinced and hey, I'm not gonna you know I'm not gonna do it. I was on the fence, and now I know. Um, and that would be great. Uh, but can we talk a little bit about female genital mutilation and sort of the the differences and the... Because the, it seems like people are very passionate about female genital mutilation, and they should be um, the, passionate that it stops. Uh, but, <clears throat> you know, maybe if we can relate the two a little bit more, then maybe we can sort of, we can harness some of that passion for our little boys as well. Yeah, if... Female genital mutilation is a topic that's evolving, especially yeah. in America. Uh, there was a recent court case in Michigan. Uh, uh, there was a federal law that made female circumcision or female genital cutting or female genital mutilation, whatever you want to call it, uh, made it illegal. And these doctors were taking babies in Michigan, taking them to their clinic and performing female genital mutilation on them. And they got caught. The FBI arrested them. The case went to trial and they got the law struck down on constitutional grounds. First, uh, first of all, there was an issue with the law and that it should be a state crime, not a federal crime. But the judge also alluded to the fact that, you know, there's supposed to be equal protection under the law and we circumcise baby boys. So uh, how are you even coming up with the idea that there's an issue with circumcising baby girls as well? So the issue of FGM, female genital mutilation, is, is evolving. Uh, many states are trying to pass their own laws that will uh, take the place of the federal law that got struck down. But it's something that Americans are really going to have to come to grips with because there's this hypocrisy that we're cutting our sons. And, and the people who believe in female genital mutilation, Muslims primarily, they're, st they're calling out this hypocrisy and they're saying, you do the same thing to your sons. How can you say that we can't do it to our daughters, especially when it comes to religion or cultural reasons? So it's it's an evolving topic and it's going to be an interesting thing to see how it how it plays out. Uh, just, some of them are just to play some, devil's advocate just a little bit. They you know, they're they are pointing out rightfully that there is this hypocrisy. We you do it to your sons. Let us do it to our daughters. You know, and I. My under, I, I'm surprised to hear that the judge did do that. The, the you know the equal rights. You know if we do it to boys, we can then it makes sense legally. We have to allow let, let people do it to their to our girls. Um, I was under the impression that it was more of a religious freedom case where you know Muslims is a Muslim is a uh, Islamic practice, and so you know the government can't get involved. But I think that's great that the judge pointed out rightfully the hypocrisy of boys versus girls um but they you know I, I would think that the counter argument to you do it to your boys what's the difference if we do it to our girls would be that it's more serious for girls and it's not very serious for boys what would you say to someone who said that well i i would say that it, you know it depends on the context you know the the World Health Organization categorizes female genital mutilation by four types. So type one is the, the least invasive. It may be a nick or a cut. And it goes all the way to type four, which is infibulation, where they actually remove the clitoris and sew up the vagina. So the type depends well, on the culture. They cut off the clitoris and sew up the vagina? Is that what you said? Sew up the vagina, yeah. They just leave an opening for urination. Jeez. I did not so, know that. That is, yeah, that is. So there's, there's 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 four types of female genital mutilation, primarily. So uh, under the category of type one, which is removal of the clitoral hood, that is the anatomical equivalent of 
the foreskin in a male. Okay, so because these body parts develop from the same uh, genesis, uh, both male and female. Yeah. Uh, they, they just get rearranged and fashioned in different ways. So uh, type one is the same. So how can you say that cutting the clitoral hood on a girl is, is a crime and removing the foreskin of a boy is not a crime? Yeah, that, I mean, it's... it's <clears throat> so it's safe to equi- uh, to equivocate the type 1 female FGM and the general male circumcision. Are the side effects of those two basically the same? I mean, as far as, like, mental side effects? Well, uh, mental and physical, I, th- I think removing the, the foreskin in the male is, is worse because the foreskin is the primary sensory organ on the penis. It has 20,000 specialized nerve endings and its function is very important. Uh, you could argue that clitoral hood on a female is, is not as important. So, I, but you know, you get into, you know, parsing who's got it worse. I don't like to do that. I like to just say, let's leave all children alone. And when they're 18, if they want to do, body modifications or cosmetic surgery, then that's their choice to do as an adult. Yeah. I, that's, that's generally my stance as well is, you know, leave, leave kids alone. They can make a decision when they're, an, they're an adult. Um, and I, I apologize. I'm not trying to uh, equivocate the two or parse, which is worse or better. I, I'm just, tr- I'm just hoping to, you know, people get a, an emotional response. And I think rightfully so to FGM and, you know, if they can be equivocated, then hopefully people will also get that sort of emotional response to male genital mutilation. And that's really what it is, is you're mutilating the genitals. You're taking, as you say, an essential part or a, a, fun, a part that is uh, very specialized and, you know, necessary in a lot of ways um, and cutting it off. You're mutilating the genitals. And maybe if people just used that word more often even that would have a positive impact yeah i've i've spoken to some feminists on this topic and and it seems like the argument they're trying to make is the intent so where the intent of female genital mutilation is supposedly to suppress the sexuality of females and in theory keep them pure until they're married uh the intent of male circumcision is is for health reasons and health benefits. So in, in their mind, you can't equiv- equivocate the two because the intent is different b- between the two. But well, I, I think uh, when my, you look into that, that's such a false, failed logic statement. Yeah, I mean, it, it. yeah, that sort of goes back to, you know, if that's the case, then we should be doing you know, preventative mastectomies on little girls just on the off chance that they might get breast cancer one day, especially because breast cancer is, you know, has such a higher rate of incidence that it, that argument would make more sense in that case, but it would still be totally immoral and a disgusting practice. Yeah. And then they failed to realize that circumcision started in America to keep little boys from masturbating. <laughs> so it was it was to suppress sexual yeah. uh, proclivity. And and you got people like Dr. Kellogg, the inventor of Kellogg's cornflakes. He was a big advocate. He was a celebrity doctor of his day. And he tried to convince Americans to circumcise their sons so they wouldn't masturbate because masturbation led to mental health issues and uh, all kinds of medical problems. And you should get rid of it before they knew what they were missing. Yeah, that's also the, the the original argument for a vegetarian diet um, from Dr. Kellogg or whatever, and the Seventh Day Adventists was a, a vegetarian diet or low animal, you know, right. product. Yeah, it it, it would right. decrease sexual desire and I guess create a more chaste moral society. I mean, it's it's Correct. crazy. It's absolutely crazy. a bland a bland diet, no red meat, no spices. No, nothing that would arouse the animal passions. <laughs> Such a, a weird, weird thing to do. Uh, it's ah, anyhow. Um, well, you know, before we wrap up, I want to make sure that people um, know how to find you, you know, website, social media, anything like that. But before we do that, is there anything that we left out that you wanted to, to mention? Uh 
I, I you know, I just want to say that uh, people really owe it to themselves if if they're having kids or if, or if, or if they know of anyone having kids to do some research. The information is all out there, and understand what how how circumcision harms babies and and question why we we're still doing it in America. Rates are declining. Uh, we think rates are declining from one to two percent per year, and we're hoping to break the 50-50 mark soon. That would be a major uh, accomplishment for our movement. But, uh, you know, the foreskin is important anatomical tissue. Again, as we said, it's the four powers of foreskin. Pleasure, 20,000 nerve endings in the foreskin. Protection, it covers the end of the penis, keeps the skin moist and supple, uh, provides its own lubrication and emollients to help the skin stay soft and healthy and it's connection. You want to bond and connect with another intact person, intact body to intact body, the way, you, the way nature intended us to be. Uh, that's that's the full experience. Yeah. And, I, and, I mean, just so people know, I mean, I, I did not, you know, as I said, I did not circumcise either of my sons and I've never dealt with a uncircumcised penis. And, you know, I, it's not a difficult thing to to handle. It's it's not hard to keep clean. It's not. It's just very. It's extremely easy. But there was this sort of you know hesitation or fear in my mind in the beginning of like, well, I don't know what to do with this. Uh, you know, it's kind of like we're, we're expecting a girl in December. I've never dealt with a baby girl and changing baby girl diapers and stuff like that. So there is a little bit of anxiety in me of, you know, what do I? I I've never dealt with this. What do I do? I don't have that part. Um, that, but it's so a, easy. It's so easy to learn. Right. That's a really good point. And, and it's, it is very easy because you know what you need to do to an intact penis on a, on a baby or young child? Nothing. Yeah. You don't do anything to it. You just wipe the outside and that's it. Uh, actually, if you try to, you, what you do, should not do at all is try to retract it or pull it back. Uh, that will tear the skin and cause scarring and a lot of pain and it's not what you should do yeah uh a lot of doctors don't even know that again they haven't been trained in this uh pediatricians and care providers if if any of them try to pull back your child's foreskin you should knock them over and don't let them do that <laughs> they will i have parents that have gotten into arguments with their doctors or care providers over this yeah if, if if it's forcible, it's called forcible retraction. If somebody forcibly retracts the foreskin on a child, it will tear the foreskin, it will tear the membrane underneath it, it will cause scar tissue, and it may lead to conditions later on like phimosis, which is irretractable foreskin. So you just the, the advice is basically leave it alone. When it's ready to retract, the boy will know it and you'll say, oh, look, I can I can retract it. It doesn't hurt. Yeah. Until that point, just just leave it alone. Wipe the outside with a baby wipe, and you're done. Yeah, it's interesting. My my oldest son did that recently. Uh, I mean, may, maybe just a few days ago, and it was weird, a weird thing for me to see because I had never really seen it, and so it was like, oh well, we've hit that stage of life now, and we're now we're here, and right. we just we just move forward. And you're right, it's it's super easy. You essentially do nothing. You just keep, you know, just wash the wash the boy like you would wash yourself, basically. Yeah, you just um, wash the outside and, and leave it alone. Uh, uh, yeah, there's there's nothing else that it needs. Yeah, well, hopefully people realize this is a very um, a very cruel uh, thing to do to a child, and they hopefully will rethink their decision. Um, but how can people find you? Where we have, first of all, our website intaction.org. I N T a-c-t-i-o-n dot org. We are on Facebook at intaction.org. We're on YouTube at Intaction One and Twitter. Uh, we, we put the information out there. We do the best we can to, to make people aware and change minds. Uh, if people think this is important and our mission is, is important to them, they should consider supporting us. We're privately funded and uh, uh, any help we can get is, is greatly appreciated because we think this is really important. I I agree with you and Godspeed. I think this is a, a fantastic fantastic work that you're doing. So as a as a male uh, concerned about future generations of males, I, I, I want to say thank you. Thank you, Brad, for having me on the show. All right, Anthony, appreciate it. Have a good day. You too. Take care. Yes, I'm here.